Okay, welcome to video 14. This is the first video on Socrates' defense at his own trial. This dialogue is often called uh, the apology, uh, and that's just because the Greek word for defense is apologia. Um, but uh, you may notice that there's nothing apologetic about what's going on here at all. And so it's more accurate just to call this um, this uh, dialogue the defense, although you, I sometimes I still call it the apology just out of habit, and a lot of other people are from, will be used to calling it that. Um, in this video, I want to introduce some of the historical background that you need to understand uh, what's going on in Socrates' defense, and I want to emphasize a theme that's really important for Plato, um, which is the idea of argument. So we saw in the Confucian tradition that rational argument rose um, to prominence with the writing of Mencius, um, who uh, was a, a later follower of Confucius. That's where you really begin to see um, uh, the kinds of arguments that we're used to in philosophy being developed. Um, and uh, in what in European philosophy, uh, it really the, the what really comes out, it, it, the idea of argument really starts to arise arise with Plato. Um, and one of the things that Plato is doing in this dialogue is contrasting the arguments of Socrates with, uh, the superficial rhetoric of other people. All right. So um, the video here, the images here, by the way, are the uh, uh, from the oldest surviving manuscript of the Plato's dialogues. It was assembled uh, sometime uh, over a thousand years ago in Constantinople, um, and it's it's pretty. I like these old manuscripts. Um, in any case, uh, the first question I asked in uh, the exercises for this dialogue uh, were just, does Socrates tell the truth when he says he's not a skilled speaker? So let's just remember, he opens the dialogue. He says, my God, uh, the, the prosecution put on such a good, made such a good case, I... I I almost forgot who I was. Um, and, you know, uh, they speak so eloquently and they're fancy people, but I, I'm, I don't speak eloquently. I just, unless, unless by eloquence you mean speaking the truth, because I, I will just speak the truth. But I'm not going to use any rhetorical tricks. I'm not going to use any fancy language um, the way that my opponents do. And so the first question I asked was just, um, is he telling the truth when he says this? Um, and hopefully you, you were able to think about this a bit and come up with some answers. I just want to highlight some common uh, answers on both sides. Um, I think for the most part, he is, he's lying. Um, he actually is an extremely sophisticated speaker, an extremely persuasive speaker. One of the things that um, he does right away, actually, and we'll talk about this m more later in the video, is he reframes the question. And this is, I think, one of the most um, sophisticated tricks uh, that anyone can do it, use in a debate. Because if you... If you control the question, you control the answer. You know what I mean? Um, uh, if um, once you change, once you establish how a debate is framed, you you can set things up so that you uh, are guaranteed to win, right? But there's more than that. I mean, he uses all sorts of other standard techniques that a, any good advertise, advertiser or politician would use. Um, uh, to convince people of, of, of anything, right? So he's got lots of hu humor. Humor is important. He uses analogies and metaphors. He uses stories and literary allusions. And honestly, I think the biggest trick that he's playing here is the claim that he's not using tricks at all, right? 
Um, you look at the you look at advertising, and there's just so many ads that are just based on the idea of oh, this isn't an ad. I'm just telling you telling it to you straight. Um, there was a Sprite ad for a while that was like you know no image, just obey your thirst. Well, I mean they're just pushing the no image image. I'm still an image. On the other hand, uh, you may have answered for any number of reasons that. Um, Socrates uh, what is telling the truth when he says that he's not uh, using any fancy rhetorical tricks or fancy language. He's not a fast-talking lawyer. Oh, why is that? Well, I think the biggest argument on this side is just that he, if he's using fancy language, it's not working because he's not trying to win over the audience. And the audience here is his jury. Right, and the jury was um, a huge jury. It was like 500 people, um, and uh, rather than trying to flatter them, which is the normal thing you do when you're before a judge, he goes out of his way to mock the jury. Right, um, the other thing that's weird, right, is he's actually on trial for blasphemy, and he routinely says things that are blasphemous while he's on trial for blasphemy. Um, and this doesn't, these aren't the actions of someone who seems to want to win their case. All right, so if this were a live class, I would, um, I would have this as a discussion question, or just, you know, I'd ask you to tell me, what are the charges brought against Socrates? Um, and maybe you want to pause the video and answer this for yourself and then um, come back. But uh, if, uh, if you just plow on, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you. So one of the opening moves that Socrates makes in um, the dialogue is, like I said before, he reframes the question. So he, there are two official charges against Socrates. Um, first, he denies the gods of the city and creates new ones. So this is on, under the category current accusers on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and that he corrupts the youth. Rather than responding to these charges, Socrates changes the topic and talks about what he calls his original accusers. And in some ways, this change of topic is justified, because what he says is, look, uh, men of Athens, gentlemen of the jury, um, you have been uh, told stories about me all your life. Um, that uh, There are horrible rumors, lies that have been told about me. And so I want to correct the rumors about me before I go to the immediate charges. So on one level, you can see how that is um, a reasonable thing to do. Certainly, right, if, the, if the jury has been corrupted by rumors, he wants to challenge those rumors. At the same time, this enables him to um, move, um, to essentially change accusers and respond not to the people who are in court right now, but to other people who were more unreasonable. Um, and, you know, maybe the people bringing the charges against him weren't reasonable either. But this way he can, he can take out easier targets. So um, the original charges uh, were that he studied things above the sky and below the earth, that he made the better arguments seem the worst, and he taught these to others, and that in general... He was uh, what we call a sophist. So what I need to do now is bring explain what's going on with this idea of a sophist. So, okay, so uh, the sophists. In the Athenian courts, one always acted as one's own attorney, right? You didn't have a lawyer arguing for you. However, you could hire coaches that would help you with your court appearance. Um, and in fact, they could even just write your speeches for you. 
You had to deliver them yourself, but um, someone else could write the speech. And so the sophists were professionals who could uh, who would prep you for your court appearance. So they were essentially lawyers. Um, they also uh, did things for uh, politicians, though, um, for the uh, you know um, for the uh, democratic proceedings in Athens, and th there were sort of similar events anyway. It was all about public speaking. Um, and so the common claim from the sophists, though, was that they could argue any side of a case and win, right? So um, it doesn't matter, according to the sophists, whether you're innocent or guilty. You come to them, uh, they will tell you the right things to say so that you um, win your case. Uh, another way of thinking about this is to think about the difference between rhetoric and logic. Um, so logic is a course I teach, right? Um, uh, I also teach critical thinking. These are essentially courses about how to argue, but they're not about any old form of argument. They're about good argument. They're about arguments that are likely to lead to truth. And this would then be contrasted with rhetoric, which is the study of any kind of effective persuasion, right? So if you, anything you can say that wins the jury over, whether it is rational or irrational, whether it's uh, whether it makes sense or not, that can all fall that 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 would all fall under the heading of rhetoric, right? And so one of the things that Socrates is doing here when he is defending himself against the original accusers is he's trying to uh, separate himself from the sophists who use rhetoric um, by saying that he only uses logic. Now, another thing that's going on here is that the sophists... Um, but claim that they could argue any side of a case and win was backed by a kind of relativist philosophy. So what is relativism? Relativism is, uh, it comes in many forms, but it's always in one way or another, the belief that there's no right or wrong answer to some question. Instead, what is true for one person is not true for another. And people are often really tempted to say, oh, what's true for you isn't true for me. Um, and they could mean all sorts of different things by it. Generally, though, we can think about situations in which you wouldn't want to say that. For instance, if you say, you, sometimes people say, oh, you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Um, so you're not going to be a people typically aren't relativist about what is going on in the physical world around them. Is the earth getting warmer or not? It, w it was that caused by human action or not? Um, these are questions that aren't true for me and true or true for you. They're true for everyone, right? Um, the sophists are going to be sort of global relativists about anything. So the reason why they say they can argue any side of a case and win is because they say there is no real right side to the case. There's only the case that you hire me to argue and I'm going to win it. Right? Um, so an example of a sophist is going to be uh, this guy Protagoras who said uh, that um, matter is the me man is the measure of all things, of those that are, that they are not, and of those that are, are not, that they are not. So everything is relative to people. Now, actually, Protagoras may have been a more sophisticated philosopher than Plato is giving him credit for, or he is giving credit for in situations like... Um, uh, the apology where uh, Socrates is trying to distance himself from the sophists. Um, Protagoras thought that um, 
matter, well, in every, the world is just a collection of seemings, essentially. There's how the world seems to you, there's how the world seems to me. You put that all in a pile and you get the world. Um, and depending upon how you interpret that, that could be a crazy relativism or not. Um, it is going to be something that Plato disagrees with. We saw in the last video the uh, analogy of the cave uh, where he says that there is a world of illusion inside the cave where you're just watching shadows on the wall and then there's the real world um, uh, that you, if you are enlightened, you can find the real world. You can break out of the matrix, as it were. Um, for someone like Protagoras, he is definitely just asserting that all there is to the world is the shadows on the wall and how they seem to the different people in the cave, right? And Plato really wants to deny that and say there is a single underlying reality that we can find if we do philosophy. All right. Um, so Socrates opens, first of all, he says, um, he starts by praising the other side. That too is a rhetorical trick, by the way. Um, uh, you, uh, you, you assume a little bit of fake humility. You let the audience, um, who may have been, um, moved by the previous speaker, um, you acknowledge their, their feelings, right? The audience was moved by the previous speaker. You acknowledge their feelings. Um, you win the trust that way. Also, it's, you get to be, be a little bit self-deprecating. Um, but that's a trick, right? Because right away he's just going to go back and start saying, actually, the previous speakers were a bunch of idiots. And then he's going to change the topic. Um, and so I want to introduce a little bit of um, uh, a few more terms from uh, logic and critical thinking here. Um, an argue, a fallacy is an argument that seems good, but is really misleading. And then a red herring is a specific kind of fallacy where you distract an audience with irrelevant evidence. Um, and so one of the things that I'm suggesting here is that maybe Socrates is um, giving a red herring. I don't know that I may also be more cynical about Socrates than you are. Um, certainly I'm more cynical about Socrates than a lot of other people uh, in my field who often view him as a hero. Okay. Um, so let's just talk about how the rest of the dialogue is going to go. Socrates starts out um, by saying he's going to speak plainly. Then he talks about the current accusers and the original accusers. Um, and like I was saying, that all boils down to um, essentially saying, I'm not like these sophists. Um, I'm, um, he, there, are also, there were also some people at the time who were like proto-scientists. Um, so when he talks about uh, investigating things above the sky and under the earth, that was the stuff that the proto-scientists were doing. And he also wants to distance himself from them. He's, so he is neither a, a sophist nor a proto-scientist. He still doesn't, after this, address the original um, accusers, though. Instead, he gives what can uh, an origin story about himself, right? You know, superheroes all have origin stories. Spider-Man was bitten by a radioactive spider, or in some versions, a, um, a, a, a gen genetically engineered spider, or maybe a radioactive genetically engineered spider. Um, but he's got this origin story. Um, he starts out just doing entertainment with his new superpowers, and then his Uncle Ben is murdered. He feels responsible for it, and he turns to fighting crime because he learns that with great power comes great responsibility.
that that's an origin story for a superhero. Um, comic books give all their superheroes origin stories because understanding the origin of a thing is a great way to feel like you really understand the nature of the thing, right? Um, so uh, it just quickly gives you a good sense of character. Socrates is continuing to um, avoid the charges and instead um, talk about himself. And what he's going to do is he's going to give his own origin story. And this is the story of the mission from the Oracle at Delphi. Um, and actually, your next batch of discussion questions is about this story. Uh, I'm just going to give, um, <clears throat> I'll give you a, an outline of it, and then uh, I want you to answer these questions um, from the dialogue just to, just to see what's really going on. Okay, so the, the story goes that the Oracle of Delphi um, says that Socrates is the wisest man in Athens. And Socrates says, I can't possibly be the wisest man in Athens. The only thing I know is that I don't know anything. And we've seen before that Socrates frequently maintains that he is ignorant, right? Um, he doesn't, he, he, he acts like he doesn't know things. Um, and so the story is he, then goes on a mission to find someone in Athens who is wiser than he is in order to prove the oracle wrong. So the oracle was, you know, a religious uh, icon, incredibly important. And even though Socrates is on trial for blasphemy, he is saying, he is actually blaspheming right now and saying, I want to try and prove that the messenger from Apollo is a liar. It's a weird thing to say. In any case, uh, he goes to three groups of people. He goes to the politicians, discovers right away that they don't know anything. Then he goes to the poets and the craftsmen. And so your next discussion question, uh, I've got four of them in two pairs. Why does Socrates say the poets are not wise? And what does that say about wisdom for Socrates? And then, why does Socrates say the craftsmen are not wise? And what does that say about wisdom for Socrates? So that's your next discussion assignment.